start my introductions. So hello everybody and um, welcome to the Avid Reader Bookshop. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be hosting this event. It's a shame it's on Zoom, but for some reasons it's not such a shame because um, we would have been down the end and I would have been a little bit smashed by the time we um, started tonight <laughs> if we'd done this in real life because <laughs> Trent would have been, um, you know, pouring the champagne liberally. Um, so it's, it's really um, a much more staid event with me sober and um, joining you tonight on Zoom. It's been wonderful running these events on Zoom. We've had people from all over the country and people um, all over the planet actually joining us. So that's really exciting. It'll be really fun to find out who is here after the event tonight. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on. In this area where I am, it is the Yagara and the Turrbal people. And I'd like to pay my deepest respects to their elders past present and emerging, and to any other elders who are here tonight with us. But I'd also like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting out onto many, many different um, Aboriginal group lands. Um, so we, we've been all over Australia, and um, I just want to acknowledge that um, there are elders from many, many other peoples um, who, who need to be um, thanked tonight. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land, and sovereignty was never ceded. And this is um, Reconciliation Week, so um, we'd like to make an extra effort of um, making sure that everybody kind of acknowledges the Aboriginal people in their area, particularly this week, but always. Um, so I think we, we still have some more people joining us all the time, but I'm going to launch off into, um, I'm going to throw to the wonderful Trent Jamison now. Um, because Trent uh, is going to show us a video and have a few words as we start. So Trent Jemison is a multi-award winning author and short story writer. He's the author of the Death Work series, The Nightbound Land, Geology, Daybore, Dayboy, and The Giant and the Sea. He's also a, a very important member of the Avid Reader family, and he's a very important member of my literary family and of my heart family. So um, I'd like you all to um, welcome the wonderful, wonderful director, Trent Jamison. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, I'm, I'm gonna actually play a video in a minute, but I thought I'd get this out of the way first, um, just because it's, it's a different format. Normally this would happen at the end. Um, I just wanted to thank a few people. Um, because with, with a picture book, it, it stops being yours when you're the writer as soon as it finds a home at an illustrator and you pass it on far sooner than a novel. Um, and this was such an incredible collaborative project and I feel really honored to have seen the book grow from a sentence that I had while I was having a nap into this beautiful, beautiful book. And I feel like I actually had a really easy bit in the production of this book. Um, so firstly, I would just like to thank Fiona Steger and Kev Guy and everyone at Avid and Where the Wild Things Are who have worked so hard to keep our shop alive and book selling alive in what's been an absolute incredible nightmare of a year. And um, to Kasia, who's actually doing the, who did my first ever window at Avid 10 years ago, my first ever book launch, and she's making one for this book too. And I just, you know, I can't wait to see it. And then for, for Chrissy, who introduced me, who's the heart of our events, who's had to grapple with this new technology and for being the best damn writer I know and the busiest and the most generous person in her time when she has a very, very little time herself. And thank you so much for that, Chrissy. And then for Alex Adset, who is simply one of the greatest agents working. She's a dear friend, an advocate and a fine person. And she's kept so many of my book dreams alive with her support and enthusiasm. And I will start crying if I go on about it, which, if I go on about it too much. Oh, and home deal. And uh, thanks to Ravina Kai for bringing this book to life. It's better than I could have ever imagined. Thank you. And then finally, uh, thanks to my publisher, Hachette, uh, Susanna Sullivan for believing in this book. Uh, she and Sophie Mayfield helped the words and the rhythms shine. And thanks to Hannah Jansen for her beautiful book design. Hannah is building a legacy of wonderful books and picture books. And finally, uh, thank you to Fiona and Essie, my beautiful girls who are having a bath at the moment and who keep me going and who I love more than anything. And obviously thank you, Megan, as well for, 
for doing our Q&A and, and for keeping this together as well. Um, I, I'm a reader uh, and a writer because of teacher librarians. And to have the queen of the teacher librarians launch a book <laughs> is an honour more than I deserve. And then finally, thanks to all of you for coming to your computers and your phones and helping us send off this book. And now I'll try and get this to work. And... I will get it working at some point. Oops, um, just a quick out of it, Trent, because you need to share screen uh, after you've opened. Uh -huh. the okay. So let's... We're getting there. We're getting there, technology. So you just need to open the files. And while we're doing that, I'm going to share um, the link to purchase the book with everybody. Oh, that just went to Emma Kate and no one else. Let's try again. Okay, can people see this? Yes. There was a giant who stood on the shore of the sea. She looked out across the water, because that is what she'd promised to do long, long ago. There was a brave girl who played on the shore. She would sing and the giant would listen. The giant never moved, the giant never spoke, the giant never looked at anything but the sea. Until one day, the giant looked at the girl. The sea is rising, the giant said. The sea is rising. What should I do? The brave girl asked. The city. There is a machine that they must turn off or you will all drown. The girl told her parents. The giant is wise, her parents said. She told you to do this. You must do it. She found the machine part of the city. We have to the machine, the brave girl said. She laughed. It is a splendid machine, the mayor said. This is the ground we don't. It's a fabulous machine, said a businessman. Now it says that the ocean will rise if it stays on. Said everyone. The girl said. People of the city grew angry, and a few became scared. The newspapers accused the giant of telling lies and eating people's chocolate when they were not looking. Eventually, the people confronted the giant. You cannot tell us to turn off the machine. The machine works. We are prosperous. It is a wonderful machine. We should come and admire it. It is as shiny as the sea. The giant shook her head. The sea is rising because of your machine. That is all I know and all I can tell you. It must be turned off. We will not let you turn off our machine. How dare you suggest it? I cannot make you turn off your machine, but the sea will. And then it will be too late. The sea is rising. The people grew angry. You may no longer stay on our shore, they said. All giants are banned. Very well, the giant said. She walked away and the people celebrated. Everyone except the girl. The people went back to the city danced around their machine and it hummed and glowed and they were happy. And the next day and the day after that, and for many more days, nothing happened. But then something did. The sea rose. It crept across the shore. It heaped its waves farther and farther inland. 
the city built walls protect them from the rising water, but the sea was stronger. The waves came over the walls and crashed down into the city and the girl was frightened. She huddled at home with her parents. There was only so much that bravery could do. Then the giant's hand reached through the girl's window and picked her and her parents up. The giant rescued as many as she could. Water rushed around below them, but up on the giant's shoulders, they were safe. The girl pointed at the people protecting the machine. I cannot help them, the giant said. Now, hold on. She strode through the water and carried them to a distant, higher shore where people had never lived. The girl and her parents and all the others she had saved were safe. The giant helped them build new houses. She helped them grow food. And soon things were almost normal. The giant stood on the new seashore by the town. I'll keep watch here, she said to the girl, because that is what I do. There was the giant who stood on the shore of the sea. She looked out across the water because that is what she promised to do long, long ago. There was a brave boy who played on that shore. He would sing and the giant would listen. The giant never moved. The giant never spoke. The giant never looked at anything but the sea. Until one day, the giant looked at the boy. The sea is rising, the giant said. The sea is rising. There we go. That was fantastic. Congratulations, Trent. That was really beautiful. And as you can see, the images in that book are just amazing. Um, and we're about to hear from the illustrator now. I'm going to um, just send you the link to the book so you can purchase the book here. It's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, it's, it's beautiful um, for, in words and also in image. So um, to introduce the, um, the pictures that go with the words, we have um, Ravina Kai. Um, and Ravina is a freelance illustrator who works across a variety of genres. Her poetic imagery has served as book covers, posters, and interior art for novels and picture books. Many of them have won major international awards. Welcome, Ravina. Hey. Um... So, yeah, I don't actually have a lot to say here. I guess I just uh, wanted to thank Trent for his just beautifully poetic and evocative story. It certainly made my job as an illustrator very easy because the words were just amazing and I fell in love with them straight away. Um, I also wanted to thank Alex Adset and the whole team at Hachette for just being wonderful to work with and very patient with me um, because when I was working on this book, I was kind of trying out something new. Like I usually draw with pencil, but I just had this crazy idea that I was gonna do everything on an iPad for this book. Uh, so everyone's very patient and understanding when I, while I like figured that out, which is nice. Um, and also on top of that, there were some scheduling issues at the start, but I'm really glad that everything worked out at the end because um, this is, I think this is such an important um, this book has such an important and timely message and I'm just absolutely thrilled to just play a part in bringing it to life, I guess. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Um, I've prepared like a little making of kind of like behind the scenes video just to show how the images came together. So, yeah, I guess we'll hop over to that now. Thanks, Trent. Yay.
Wow. Well, that was absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm sure, just like me, everybody out there um, thinks that illustrators are like magicians. Uh, <laughs> there's something amazing about watching the work come to life. Um, and do um, remember, we've had somebody um, saying that um, that was amazing and magic um, and blown away by Ravina's illustrations. And I totally agree. And that is... Um, also where you can type your questions. If you have any questions during the Q&A tonight, you can type them into that chat, chat function. And then at the end, after um, Megan has done her Q&A, I will um, uh, feed Megan um, some of the questions at the end. So um, after that bit is done, um, I think that we're just about to consider this book officially launched. Um, and to do that, I'm gonna introduce you to the queen of, um, of children's and YA books, Megan Daly, who is a pa who's passionate about children's literature and sharing it with young and old alike. In Daylight Hours, Megan is a teacher librarian at a girls' school in Brisbane, and was recently awarded the Queensland Teacher Librarian of the Year by the School Library Association of Queensland, as well as the National Dromkeen Library Award, presented by the State Library Victoria. A former National Vice President of Children's Book Council of Australia, she is currently on the Queensland chapter of the board of the Australian Children's Laureate and is a judge for the Queensland Literary Awards. She blogs about all things literary, library and tech and has her own book out about reading and the importance of reading. It's ama She's amazing. Please um, put your hands together silently, of course, or maybe like this in sign language for Megan Daly. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chrissy, and thank you so much uh, for to everyone for joining us here tonight. I know it's a tricky time of day for people to join us, but I do, um, you know, as much as I would love to be at Avid Reader with a glass or two or three of champagne in hand, it is actually really lovely that so many people can join us from all over Australia and internationally and then watch this later. So there is some advantages all of this. But yes, like Chrissy said, we are here tonight to celebrate the launch of the Giant and the Sea. And if you've got a glass of champagne or water or lemon lime and bitters or a cup of tea will do, even a bottle of water will do, um, I would like you to raise that now as we just really give a massive, massive congratulations to the team behind the Giant and the Sea. Firstly, Fred Jamison and Ravina Kai, but also all of the team behind this book, um, Alex and Emily and everybody at Hachette. It's just such an astonishing book. I've been very privileged to have um, one of the very few copies in circulation for quite some time now. And I've so, I remember when the package first arrived in my letterbox, I sat down on my driveway because I knew it was going to be good. I had confidence it was going to be good. And I saw the front cover of it and I just was blown away by, well, firstly, by the gold. I mean, you always know a picture book is going to be fabulous if a publisher has invested in, the, in a bit of gold foiling. I love a bit of gold foiling. Um, but it's just exquisite. The illustrations are evocative and, and beautiful and everything that Regina Kai has become known for. And Trent Jamison, um, look, he just gets the word so right. I was just saying to him earlier as we were setting up that I think my maths isn't very good because I'm a teacher librarian, not a maths teacher. But I think I tallied up this afternoon that I've now read it 27 times to different classes. And I was saying to Sharon earlier, when I read a book aloud, very occasionally I will change a word in a book and, and that word will become stuck in my head and that's how I will read the book aloud to a group of children. But I have not changed a single word in this book and I think that is very telling that Trent has really laboured over each and every word. Every word is perfect and it, as Ravina said, um, it, it's really evocative and poetic writing. It's absolutely exquisite. So, you know, little hands in the air, yay, 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 to Ravina and Trent. I, as I officially launched this book via Zoom um, across the world, and I am just so looking forward to seeing it really just do amazing things. And of course, some of you may already know that there has already been film rights sold to Trent Light book about briefly soon. 
I'm going to ask Trent some questions in a tick, but as I said, I have read this book um, extensively to my classes at school. I've, I teach in a um, prep to grade six library and I've read this with about grade three and up so far. Um, and I've had some excellent teachers from the high school reading it with my grade six students as well. And I've just summarized a couple of the things that the students have said about the book. Um, and I can just see that Christy's put up there, please do purchase the book from Avid Reader tonight um, because Trent does work at Avid Reader and he will be very happy to sign uh, your books to you, inscribe them personally to you, won't you Trent? Um, <laughs> so please do click on that link and purchase them. But my grade, um, my sort of grade four to six students have said quite a few things about this book. Um, like all illustrated texts, and I often um, refer to these types of books as an illustrated text or a piece of art that you should hang on your wall uh, rather than a picture book, because really they, they are illustrations and, and they are works of art and, and with words, obviously. But I, with picture books for older readers, there can be that challenge of who is the audience and will the audience connect with the book? But every single class has come up with the following. They've said it's about climate change, it's an environmental warning, it's about global warming, it's about activism, it's about standing up for what you believe in, no matter how old you are. Um, and quite a few of the classes said that it was also about consumerism and obsession with the obsession with and worship of machines and progress and technology in the age in which we live. There was even talk of a large department store and how we shouldn't be purchasing things from said large department stores to make our bedrooms look um, Pinterest worthy because it was all contributing to the problem of the sea rising. So we had some quite in-depth discussions and when I always ask children how a book makes them feel and these words came up time and time again. It made them feel sad, it made them feel scared, it made them feel aware it made them feel motivated and it made them feel hopeful and I think motivated and hopeful are really really important words to um, cling on to there. They, all of the children were really happy that the giant was female and almost every single class picked up on the fact that the giant was female. Often our giants in books are male and they are oppressive and they have um, some strong um, behaviours about them. I'm trying to use the right, right language here, but um, they loved that the giant was female. I think that was actually really important. Um, and they loved that there wasn't a solution to the problem at the end, that the start and the ending were the same. And here um, we talked about the technique of book ending and we loved that Trent really took this on board. So Trent, I'm starting there. Can you tell us about the genesis of the idea for the giant and the sea? Um, I, I wish it came from a, a more exciting place. Um, but I was writing a novel and I actually had a grant to write this novel and it was not going very well at all. And it was uh, a period where I actually had quite a bit of time at home to do it. And um, I actually had a nap and I woke up with the opening sentence of this book and um, I had no idea what it was. And I just had to write the rest of the rest of the story. And at that stage, it could have been a short story. It could have been the beginning of a novel. Um, it was also, I was a slightly obsessed with giants at the time and I was, I was writing this and, um, the, the book flowed from there, but I think I just poured all of my worries and concerns about climate change into this book. And it surprised me as it, as it went along. I didn't know what was going to happen. And, and then by the time I'd finished it, I thought I've written this children's book about climate change or, and it's kind of my sort of slightly anti-capitalist story as well. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't know what I had until I'd finished it. And then I, I felt that there was something there. And I, to, normally what, what I do with this short story or, or, a, or a novel or any book is I actually put it aside for a long time because I know every time I get excited about something I've written and I show it to someone, it's a complete mess. And they just look at me and go, oh, really? Um, I thought you could write. Um, but this one I was so happy with, I actually sent it to... Alex, my agent, and said, basically, um, I've written another children's book and it's kind of weird. And, um, but I wasn't sure, I felt like there was something there, but I wasn't sure and I actually needed that kind of feedback. And yeah, it, it sort of grew from that. Alex was, you know, she, she came back pretty quickly. Um, quite often when you, when you send something, it's like six months. It was like a week, I think, or something like that. Um, and so I knew because I'd gotten a quick response, it was okay. Um, and yeah, we started working on refining it at that point. 
Um, so I, I feel like it wasn't a book that I set out to write about climate change. It just really amplified. It was, it really, I, I think when I write, I really try to write to work out what I'm thinking. It's how I work out most of my emotions is by writing them down. And I think this book just was that, it was just me working out what I thought about these issues. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah. So I'm, anyone that knows my process knows that it's absolutely chaotic. It, um, I tend to just grab ideas, throw them down. Sometimes I don't even write a book in order. Um, I just write particular scenes and then edit them together like a film. Um, and then there's a lot of rewriting, a lot of recrafting after that. But the initial thing is chaotic. But this actually flowed from the beginning to the end and that the, the shape of the story was there in that first draft. I had a look at it, it's too wordy, the first draft. You can tell I'm a novelist, not a children's book writer, um, but we, we cut that stuff back. But the bones of the book that were there from that very first draft that was basically about 45 minutes sitting just to the left of me at this kitchen table, I sat down and, and wrote it there. And um, yeah, I, I, I feel like I've, 90% of what I, I write is a real struggle and I'm putting things together and trying to work out what I'm thinking about something. But this book was that weird 10% that actually just flows and is kind of the shape from the beginning. So, mm. yeah, mm. which makes it hard to, to talk about in a way. No, it doesn't. Everything you said makes perfect sense to me, except the chaotic bit, because I'm a librarian and I would want to sort that out. Um, <laughs> but no, everything else makes perfect and amazing sense to me. And I, I love that um, the genesis of the idea was almost so organic and that you didn't sit and labour over it. Now, do you think that having a child of your own led you down the path and into the world of children's after many years of being an acclaimed writer of adult literature, um, you know, I know that you've got a young daughter yourself. Well, actually, no, but it, it certainly has changed the way I approach children's fiction now. Um, and last year I judged the, the um, QLAs, the children's books. Um, but I was, it was something that I always wanted to do. I, I love children's books and, and picture books in particular. And I'd been trying. I, I'd written a lot of, as Alex will attest, there are some massive failures there. Um, and I, I was, I think I was in the right mindset to write this. And I feel, um, because Essie wasn't born, I didn't even know Essie was coming until about a year after this book was accepted. Um, and yeah, I, I think she's really brought my focus into, you know, writing about these particular themes and how you can talk about climate change to to younger people and in in a way that's not because you know it's it's a depressing horrible scary topic and you and we we need to be able to, to talk about it in a way that's digestible and isn't completely overwhelming but doesn't belittle it as well and um i think that's one of the things i i've i know having a child has taken a lot of the darkness out of things that I would normally write now. I feel that I can't do that. I, I, just, um, I, I get much more emotional. Um, I was happier to kill characters than I am now, which is, which is getting a bit tough. Um, and yeah, so I, I feel like it has, it's, it, Essie has changed the way that, that I view the world, the way I think about the world. Um, it's, she's certainly, made me much more aware of that we only have this very small time on this planet and we're really here to keep it safe for the next generation we're here to pass it on and i i feel like the last few generations perhaps we haven't been doing that as well as we could mm. and it's something that we need to really begin to think about doing again and think of ourselves as caretakers and you know caretaking is a joyful thing it's not a it's not meant to be a burden it's meant to be something that's joyous and I feel that's something that you can do in, in, in fiction, no matter how dark you go. I mean, with, with fiction, you are exploring the whole human condition and, and that is darkness and light. And, you know, we should go everywhere because that's where you can go. It's a safe place to, to explore that stuff. 
Yeah, I love that because that's something I feel very, very passionately about myself that the light and the dark should be explored in children's literature because, um, you know, so often in the past we've seen books which are all glitter and fairy tales and magical ponies and unicorns, but in fact that's actually not what the whole experience of life is about. Life is about the light and the dark and experiencing both of them and I think that Children's literature is a great place to explore those topics because it gives children the language to articulate some of the things that they are going to experience or are experiencing. And I think that that's one of the things I really loved about the giant and the sea. And you heard that in the, the things that my own students said, it made them feel motivated and hopeful, even though the, the subject matter is quite dark and bleak. And, and we all know global warming is a very serious issue. There is hope because we can take action. And I feel like this book is a call to action in, in many senses. Um, the text is really lyrical and a lot of the lines left me with, with goosebumps. I've got two really favourite lines from the book. One of them is quite funny and all of my students loved it. And I loved that you inserted this, this tiny little bit of humour. Um, the, the line is, newspapers accuse the giant of telling lies and eating people's chocolate when they were not looking. Um, and my other favourite line is an incredibly powerful line and one that I, I want to hang on the wall in my office. Um, and it is, there is only so much that bravery can do. And it's accompanied by a stunning image by Ravina of, of the girl with her, her parents. And it's, I think, my favourite line in the whole book. Um, we've heard you talk a little bit about the words but you know and the first draft obviously did come to you quite quickly but when you were laboring i don't know when you were laboring over each word you know was that process done with with alex and with your publisher or, or did you know did it happen fairly quickly for you i, I want to say that i labored more than i did with this book um but you know i had wonderful editors and mm. i feel that that really helped shape it too i'm I, I, the one thing I really love about writing a book is the collaborative process of it, that sense that you have editorial input that you kind of smash up against and it just, it creates something new. It gives it that, it's like, it's like turning the coal into a diamond. Um, and, you know, I, I think I got really good input with this book too. And I tend to be a person that, you know, novelists, we, we over, over complicate things sometimes. Um, we, uh, you know, if there's three ways of explaining something, we'll use all three ways. And with this, I think because I, once I was aware that it was going to be a picture book, that meant that it was all about opening up a space for the reader and for the artist to work with the story. Um, and for just having that, you know, rhythm is so important to me. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back. This is weirdly jumping back, but it, it leads into rhythm. Um, my favorite children's book, it's not a picture book, it's The Wizard of Earthsea, which is about darkness and light. And Ursula Le Guin wrote that, and um, I read that book nearly every year, and it just, you know, I find something new in the rhythm of that prose. And she, Ursula Le Guin wrote this amazing book called Steering the Craft, which is about the craft of writing. And her emphasis is on the rhythm of story and prose and sentences. and you know, I just reread and reread that book and um, it really has driven the way that I approach writing, which is to try and have the rhythm. And I find if I have, if I start off a story without even knowing much about the characters or the situation, but I have that rhythmic beat to it, that will just pull me through. Uh, it's when I lose that, that I find the drafts tend to go a bit crazy. Um, so yeah, I'm, I always, I'm always chasing a kind of a beat to a story. And then when it's there, you don't even need to think about it too much. So, I mean, I, I guess I've been writing since I was about five and I've always wanted that kind of, there's a certain type of prose that appeals to me and it's rhythmical prose, be it poetry, be it, I think a lot of fantasy latches onto that rhythm as well. And it's what really appeals to me. So I, I guess that, even if I'm not laboring over something, once I have that beat, I can generally follow it through. And then it's just a matter of finding the bits where you kind of got a bit distracted and, and, and winnowing that down and, and finding that rhythm that, that will draw you through. And you get, a lot can be forgiven if you have rhythmical sentences that, that, you know, they don't even need to be necessarily beautiful, but they just have to have this beat because that's, you know, the human heart, you know, hum, humans are a beating creature. We have this heart that thumps and, and the way we think tends to be in a kind of a rhythmical way as well. 
and then when you have the C as well, and you know, the C is a very strong element in this, and the machine, they both have rhythms too. So trying to find that is, yeah. so a lot of that stuff happens in the back of your brain. And, and I find quite often when you're talking about your process as a writer, it's kind of looking back at what you did and going, oh yeah, that's actually what I meant, or that's mm. what I was doing. Or you were doing it at the time, you didn't really know. But I guess, you know, that's like when you walk to the shops, you've still got to, there's a lot of mechanical stuff that goes on in that walking, but you get there and without thinking about it too much. And I, you know, so I don't know if that answers that question, but. Uh, it absolutely answers it. And I think I'd love to take that little snippet of what you just said and show it to everybody that is trying to write themselves and to my students in grade seven who are currently writing a short story. Um, you know, because that is so, everything you just said is, like I just said, it's what I want to say to the kids at school, writing a story, like look how many years you have worked on getting that rhythm going in your head and understanding the way words work and the way words are put together. I think so. Sometimes I, I, nobody on this Zoom is one of these people, but there are people out there in the world who look at a picture book and go, well, oh, you know, I could do that. Um, in fact, it's an incredible craft and it's an incredible skill and it's, it's, it's a gift that you, uh, it's a gift you've given, but it's, a, it's something that you work very, very hard at. And all of that stuff that you've done in the background is what has meant the giant MC is the lyrical and poetic text that it is because, you know, without that, um, it would just be words on a page. They would not be as exquisite as they are. And I also really like, I often talk as well about, because obviously a lot of um, teens and, and, you know, some of the audience that will be reading this book are terribly into music themselves. And I often use the analogy of the music that they're listening to and say, music is, this, is, is just like a picture book. It's just words set to a beat, it's got a rhythm to it. And songwriting is the same as picture book writing. It's the same as fantasy writing. It's got a real rhythm to it. And I guess then going with that music, Theme and I've worked a lot with um, our music department at school and, and some summer music schools that I've been involved in where we've put books to music. I know that you've um, the rights to this book have been sold for a, a short film. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful there'll be some beautiful music that will be in the background of that short film. Can you just tell us briefly about um, what has happened with that process of the selling the film rights? Well, it was... Uh... It's, it's been such an interesting ride because yet, yet again, when you, when you think about a picture book being sort of handing something on to the artist and to the design team, uh, this is like a, a further handing on of, of our, our uh, vision. Um, and from what it, it, I'm really excited about because I think it's going to be an absolutely beautiful short film. It's an, going to be animated. Um, yeah, it's... And I, I've looked at Leica Photon's work and, and they just do amazing things and they do it with real heart. And, and having an animation team that, that, that produces stuff with heart, um, yeah. You can I, ask for more. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's going to be very exciting. Yeah. So I think yeah. just cross everything, you know, uh, these are crazy times. Yeah. But fingers crossed that, that it gets made up. So I, I can't wait to see what somebody does with that work and with that imagery. And, yeah. And, you know, and it, it's it's so... In, in a way, because I, I, I'm, I don't see myself particularly as being involved in, the, in that process at, at all. It'll just be fascinating to go along for the ride and, and, and see what they do with the book. Yes, it will be. I'm really looking forward to it as well. Um, so obviously when talking about the um, words and leaving room for the illustrator, you've obviously pared back your writing in order for Ravina to then come along and work her incredible magic. Um, what was the process with engaging um, Ravina as the illustrator for The Giant and the Sea? That was really, really wonderful. Um, we were thinking about who to have. It was, it was when we, when they were interested in the book and they wanted to make an offer, um, we had to think about an artist. And Ravina had already, been, we'd sort of, Alex and I had talked about her, um, and I, I'd seen a lot of her work, but I, I didn't know it was Ravina's work. And Alex said, you know, have a look, have a look at her stuff. And it was just, it was like looking at all my internal like artistic obsessions um just but given life and form and, and there, there was something about her work that is just like it's so solid but airy at the same time and it moves and, and it breathes and um 
Yeah, because my obsessions, my art, the things that I love to write about essentially are, are death, um, a whole series about that, um, clocks, and then people changing into birds, giants, um, things with a really strong sense of place and motion. And I just, you know, when I look at anything that Ravina does, it's just, it's startling and beautiful. And, and yeah, so we, we kind of slant towards her and fortunately it, it all, you know, things aligned and yeah, it was just you know, an absolute dream. I, I can't, you know, I can't think of anything that, I, I can't think of an artist that would have, is, is a better match for that story. And, and I have to say, cause there, there are, there are two children's books, children book artists that I, that I adore. And Ravina is one and Sean Tan is the other. And mm. I have to say this because I always do. It's my little name drop. The first short story I ever sold was illustrated by Sean Tan in, in Eidolon, which um, is a, you know, it's a, a small press science fiction magazine from Perth. And so it doesn't seem that remarkable because Sean was like about 16 or 17. He um, was still fantastic. He was. And I great. love that. I love that picture. It's just, I have a copy of it just stuck on my, in my study. And um, I, I, yeah, it, it's one of those things that gives me a lot of comfort to look at that. And, I, you know, I wasn't that much older when, when I saw that story as well, but it's always been like a, a point of pride. Um, and I actually ran into Sean at Worldcon like in 2010. And I was just like saying, you know, oh, I just wanted to say that, cause I was trying to angling, angling to see if he had it somewhere. Cause it just would have been a, a sketch somewhere. And, you know, I said, you know, you illustrated a story and you remember the story and he asked me about one detail if he'd gotten it right. And I said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh yeah, my dad loves that story. He has it on his, on his wall. So it was like, oh. so yeah. It was oh, that bad. is beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. So you've I, had I, your two favourites now. So that's, you know, absolutely. that's pretty remarkable, you it know. Really is. It's like so lucky. Absolutely. Just so lucky. I, I um, and and I've got two of Ravina's prints up on the wall here and they're just deaf. They're so beautiful. They're quite remarkable, yeah. And Ravina, I'm going to bring you in here at this point. Um, you know, likewise, I have followed your career, um, well, probably not from the start because now I've just heard Sean Tan was illustrating at a very young age, but I feel like I've looked at every single um, children's book that you've done anyway and just been wowed by each of them and actually what you said Trent is very true there's there's an incredible sense of um solidity about your work but also I've loved your pencil lines I love the fineness of your pencil lines I I love the light and the air in your illustrations they are spectacular and there's also incredible movement in everything that you do movement and color it seems incredibly important i feel like you often pick an accent color that is the highlights throughout um your work i i've been really blown away by by your work in the children's book industry um and as someone who feels very passionately about that i wanted to say thank you for doing children's books because uh, for me, a picture book is often a child's first experience of art. And I always say to my children at school that these books should hang on your walls at home as works of art. This is often a child's first exposure to high art and to have the work of such a sophisticated illustrator in the children's uh, literary space is, I think, incredibly important and wonderful. So please keep staying in our space you can do other things but if you could stay in the kid lit space that would be really good um i wanted to ask a little bit about perspective i feel like perspective and some of you have seen um the illustrations in trent's video earlier and obviously you will all be purchasing the books through the other reader link at the bottom of the page um so that you have your own copy but um i do feel like looking at the illustrations really carefully perspective is really important to you you've placed the viewer at different points Sometimes you feel like you're watching the action. Um, the people worshipping the machine image was really powerful. I thought I felt like I was almost one of the people there worshipping the machine and I wanted to step back from that, that page. Then you're above the sea watching it as it creeps farther and farther inland and then right up close, um, you're with the giant space. Did you play with the perspective in drafts or did you have a really clear idea from the start about where you wanted to position the viewer? 
Um, I'm afraid I'm going to make illustration sound like just like super easy and like, you know, just like a thing that I do, but uh, it's easy for you. I didn't. Um, so the weird thing about this book is that, um, I guess everything kind of came very naturally and very easily. And I think it's funny that Trent was talking about like rhythm and stuff. And I think that's part of it that the story had such a solid rhythm and like kind of like poetic sense to it that it you know as I said it made my job super easy um the first time I read through the manuscript I was already getting image ideas and so it was just a matter of kind of like sitting down and drawing them and that's it um but there is it's kind of like I think the great thing about the story that I responded to was that there were really solid emotional beats already in the story. So it was really easy to just kind of like pick those out. So like the spread where, you know, the water was rising and also the one where you mentioned where the people were like worshiping the machine. If those were like solid kind of like emotional beats that I knew I had to hit, they, you know, I knew the kind of emotions that I wanted to convey um, at that po or at those points in the story. So it was really, really easy to just kind of make those images and then fit everything around them if that makes sense so like mm -hmm. I that because those were so like kind of like such dramatic images that i wanted the other images to then kind of be more like calm and just like you know for the reader to be able to like rest on those pages so um mm -hmm. did I answer your question not really it didn't really have to no, read it does it, it does stuff. because i think that shows what an exquisite text you were working with he, he yeah. made the job very easy for you yeah. um did, did you remove any of his words i've i've heard before of you know illustrators saying oh you, you probably don't need that now because i've done this did you change anything or suggest oh, no. Anything? no way what no <laughs> um i see my job as an illustrator to as um being one where it's kind of like supporting the text and like maybe adding to the text but mm -hmm. the most important thing to me is conveying the the author's story in a way mm -hmm. that you know it's like kind of like guiding the reader through something if that mm -hmm. makes sense so i would never dream of like changing anything like the text is like the like ultimate thing that i'm working from so yeah, I think the text and the illustrations work so in such synchronicity and, and you know, to, to get a, a book, um, it, it's, it's not, it is a rare thing actually to get a book of this beauty and, and wonder um, and I, there is just such a beautiful synchronicity between the text and the images. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the colour palette because that's something that I know my students were really, really interested in. A lot of them mentioned that it was the colours of nature, that they were, a few um, children said they were bleak. I didn't find the colour palette bleak but I found it very, I actually found it quite soothing and calming um, but then you've obviously added um, some then really powerful shades in there so can you tell us a little bit about the color palette and choosing it yeah um i'm really glad you asked that question actually and i'm so glad that your students actually picked up on that because it was it's like color is a thing that i kind of like focus a lot on but i feel like most people when they look at my work they're just like oh it's like really like you know black and white and i'm like no there's a lot of color in there <laughs> like huge amount of color but yeah the, i kind of i did a kind of weird thing with the color um I wanted to try using the color in a way where it was symbolic. So at the start of the book, um, I used a lot of kind of like warm, warm, like yellow kind of glowy colors. Um, and then as the book progresses, it kind of, the, the text gets kind of darker and more serious. So the colors get more desaturated and, you know, when, when the water kind of rises, it becomes like black and white. And then once they find the new kind of like place, the, like in the new setting the color kind of returns or the the warm colors return so i'm really hoping that readers pick up on that and um it's good to hear that you know that yeah, yeah i think they absolutely have um there was you know i think color is an incredibly important thing to young children and i when i'm reading a picture book i always say to my students my job is to read the words but you guys have to read the images and i i really really encourage the students that I'm teaching to to really deeply read the images and after we've read the book we'll then put the book down on the ground and all sit in a circle and look at the images and pull them apart they really loved the um the motif of the bird throughout the book there seemed to be some birds flying throughout the book then Trent I noticed you earlier mentioned that you you love the bird thing as well so um they really liked the birds and um, they did wonder what the, if, if birds symbolised anything in particular or, you know, did they just 
occur naturally. There's, there's birds throughout on the final spread. I love the things coming down from the giant's hair and there seems to be wings or birds coming out at the end. Are the birds symbolic? Um, not particularly, but the great thing about art is that I love when people kind of pick up on things that I might not actually have intended to put in the book. And it's really nice that way with art that you can kind of just read your own meaning into things. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. really. but uh, I think I just use birds as a way to create movement through a page because so, mm -hmm. I want I want to like, kind of like pull viewers through the, the whole book in a way where you know, like there's like a like a sense of movement so that people want to keep turning the page and like keep yeah. Putting, Sorry, that's so. that's really that's really beautiful because I, I think I said right at the start I love you your books to me do have such a sense of movement in them your images and I love that idea of pulling the viewer I'm going to use that tomorrow in a library lesson I love the idea that you've pulled the viewer through the pages that's that's beautiful um, and finally I just wanted to ask you you said right at the start that um, and I actually thought this was done with pencil as you've normally done you said that you did this entirely on an iPad and I was a little bit taken aback. Um, I've seen some exquisite iPad uh, created books over the last few years, but I really did not pick up on this. So this is obviously something new that you tried with this book. Um, you're obviously incredibly happy with it. I, the, I, a lot of my students mentioned the layers as well of this book. Um, there's a real sense of depth in the illustrations and you feel like there's, I, I have a, see, I'm such a teacher. I have a colored pencil in my hand. Um, there's, but there's this real sense of layers throughout the book, which are quite dramatic at times. So were all those layers created separately or can you just tell us a little bit about the process of using the iPad? Sure. Um, it actually is the same as pencil, but the only, the good thing about working on an iPad is there's an undo button, like indefinitely, so you can <laughs> change and edit things as much as you want. Maybe that's a bad thing, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, but yeah, it's just the same as drawing with a pencil and paper, but um, I just did it because, as I said, it's easier to change things, and also I could draw on my couch, which is good, you know? <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it was a new thing for me at the time, but since then I've actually just gone completely. Just I'm, I draw everything on an iPad now because it's just so convenient. But I try to keep it exactly the same as I would if I were drawing with pencil. So uh, well, I I mean I don't know why I think I would pick up on it, but I I was a bit like wow, she did it all on an iPad when you said that earlier. So it, it's just amazing it and when you do all have a copy of the book in your hands, just look at the pencil work in it. It is just. You know, if Trent laboured over the words, I feel like you've laboured over everywhere every line has gone. It's just the, the line work in your your illustrations is, is beautiful. So, you know, um, thank you both so much for talking with us this evening. It's actually, you know, this is the great thing about having these things online. We can have people streaming in from all over the place. We wouldn't have had Ravina with us in Brisbane if we had have just um, been at Avid Reader, which would have also been very nice, although we would be a little bit cold right now. Um, so I just wanted to thank you so very much for talking to us this evening. Christy, have we got some questions? We do. At all? We do. Um, and just one or two for Ravina before I throw to Trent. Um, Ravina, do you sell your prints, particularly from this book? Do, are they for sale um, through uh, your website or something? I have not organised that yet, but I will <laughs> soon. They will be available and there will be a link on my website, my social media. Fantastic. And I, and I have actually seen, sorry to jump in, Chrissy. I I've, I've was saying to Ravina before this started, I've, I've discovered Ravina on Twitch, if any of you use Twitch. Um, and she, and I've looked really closely at her website and nearly hit add to cart. Her website does have quite an extensive range of, of prints on there. So I was, yeah, amazed, Ravina. Crazy. Um, so, Ravina, one question for you from Emily, age nine. Ravina, when did you start to learn to draw? Um, I kind of just always drew. Like, I started drawing as a child, and then I just kept drawing, and then I drew some more, and then suddenly I'm illustrating books, basically. So, yeah, I never stopped. <laughs> so you started as a really little child? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, like all kids draw, right? And then, yeah, I just feel like I kind of just never stopped and I was never really good at anything, anything else in school. So I just, yeah, it's like you blink and suddenly people are asking you to make picture books somehow. So uh, Emily, age nine, please don't stop drawing is yep. the answer to this question, I think. Um, Trent, um, there's Luke has said, hi, Trent, big fan here. I was lucky enough to be in one of your workshops a couple of years ago. I was wondering what inspired you to write children's books as opposed to your regular genres. 
And is this a direction that you will move to in the future? I don't know. Um, I, I think I like to write in, in all genres. And, I, and I, I still think my love is for the novel. That, that's the form that I adore. Um, and it will probably be my next book will be a novel. Um, I have a stack of picture books on the go. Um, and, I, and I do, I am starting to think about different stories that might work as a picture book. But I do find that like actually going in with the intention of doing something quite often stops it. So um, like every time I've sat down and thought, this is going to be a picture book, that does not work. Um, I just have to follow the story. So I, I feel that if more picture books come to me, then yes, but I, I don't really want to aggressively chase them in, in fear of, of, of destroying something that, that's waiting. So you have adult books to move forward to in the future? Yes, indeed. And quite a few of those. I've had maybe a little bit too much time to work on those lately. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think I, this is not a, I think this is an adjunct to all the other strange things that make up a career as a writer and something that I've just enjoyed so much. So I'm not, you know, I'm not resistant to publishing more children's books. It's just a matter of whether or not I can write something that is, is as good, basically. There's also a question here about how do you balance, when you wrote this book, how did you balance um, hope with the stress that um, climate change brings? Um, I think I just tried to write honestly. Um, and I think we all have to balance that because we're living this, you know, this is a parable or a, or a fable. Um, so things are heightened, but we are living in this world that is experiencing climate change. And yet we still get up every day. And some days that's easier and some days it's harder. Um, but so I think I just, I think too, that, that chocolate line that's in the book, um, there is a very long, large strain of kind of silliness that's in me. I, I tend to write quite dark books, but I'm a pretty silly person. So I think that also counterbalances that too. I think that that's one of the reasons why we love working with you so much, Trent. Oh. Um, you make our days at the bookshop incredibly lovely um, with your humour and your love and your care. Um, so we appreciate you immensely. Um, there are so many other questions here, including, I'll just quickly um, throw to Ravina. Um, what program did you use for illustrating? It's a very technical question. Um, I, so on an iPad, I'm using Autodesk Sketchbook Pro. Okay, Sorry. write that one down. Sorry. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but we have come to the end of our time here. I think it's really important that um, we get to all raise a glass um, to you, Trent. So I would like, you know, if you have um, a glass handy, if um, we can just raise it to Trent um, and to Ravina um, and to the team who've put this together. So congratulations to the team that have put this incredibly beautiful book together. Cheers to you. Vodka in that. Um, <laughs> and thank you so much, Megan. It's been really fascinating to hear um, uh, your perspective. And um, I've put a link to your book, Raising Readers, as well in the um, chats comments here. So if people want to purchase um, Megan's um, book, it will give you a really good insight into how to bring the joy of reading into the lives of um, young people everywhere. Because I think that it's really important, particularly in 2020, it's really important. Absolutely. To bring hope. I think books have been really, really a big part of um, the hope in what has been a really, really terrible year so far. They've been a way for children to escape. And Chrissy, I just wanted to thank you and the team at Avid Reader for everything that you do as well, our independent stores, and in particular Avid Reader is, you know, the beating heart of its local community. And I am so pleased that you have reopened, um, that you offered such an amazing, and you are still offering such an amazing service in, in people's homes and with your remote selling off books and everything that you have been doing, Christy, and I know the upskilling that you have had to do with um, all of the technicalities of Zoom and this online format. But um, yeah, I just really wanted to thank Avid for what they've done and, and Trent and Ravina and Alex and Emily. Thank you so much as well for being the team behind what is an astonishing book. 
absolutely. And if um if you do purchase it through us at that link that I've shared several times, um, Trent will be happy to personally sign it to you. Just in the notes field as you're ordering, just make sure that you um, let him know who to sign it to. Or if you just want a generic signature, that's completely fine as well. And we do free gift wrapping too. So if you want to sign to somebody and wrap to somebody, um, that's absolutely fine as well. I've got so many messages of congratulations to you, Trent. Um, and so many people um, saying that they absolutely love the illustrations, Ravina. This has been fantastic. Um, there was a question actually about the pre-order for a chance to win the print. Um, and that um, would have, that will have ended um, now, that pre-order for the chance to win the print. I don't think it has been launched yet. Is that correct, Trent? Uh, no, we, have, we haven't drawn it yet. Um, we'll do that tomorrow. Great, so that will be tomorrow. So um, check out our Twitter and our Facebook feed tomorrow as we draw the winner um, of that amazing print. Um, I'm gonna unmute people now. So um, with all the thank yous that are coming in, it's, it's quite distracting seeing so many people saying it's been such a wonderful evening. And I'm gonna give everybody a chance to um, congratulate you guys in person as we move from this orderly Zoom conversation to the chaos of... <laughs> up to everybody so you know if you are um, on your phone ordering you know something naughty that you shouldn't be ordering um, maybe keep it down a little because you'll probably be front and center and we'll be able to hear you this always happens um, and I'm going to unmute everybody um, chaos reigns yeah so <laughs> where's my unmute everybody um, the button seems to be missing today how bizarre Give me a second. Um, I'm going to allow you to un unmute yourselves because the unmute all button seems to be missing for some reason. So I'm unmuting everybody. You can unmute yourself and let's clap. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Trent. Come on, Trent. Jennifer Stevens. I'm actually talking. Yeah. Yay. Congratulations, Trent. Congratulations. Hello. Ron Henderson, you didn't make the technology break. Congratulations, Trent and Ravina. Oh, thanks, Ron. Congratulations, Trent and Ravina. Congratulations. Oh, there's Jen and the team at where the wild things are. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. It's beautiful. Thank you. Why? Oh, it's nicely chaotic. Oh, there's Anna. This is like the play school where you, they all go through the window. There's Jen. I can see Fiona and I can see Anthony. I can see Cass Moriarty. Hello. <laughs> uh, Hello, Bianca. Thanks, guys. Oh, Elise. I can see Elise. Congratulations, Trent. Thank you. Congrats. Okay, I'm gonna let. Uh, I'm gonna end the meeting now. So see everybody. Bye. Thank you. Congratulations, Ravina. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Bye.